So Andy, watch what you say as soon as you see that one. <laughs> That's right. No revealing anything. <laughs> <laughs> On waiting, wait for everyone's in. Hello. Good, e good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. How are we doing? Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I'll just test everybody. Have you guys? Have you guys? Have you guys? You want to mute? We can just get everybody to go on mute, please. That'd be great. So we can start off. Wonderful. We can um, bring you all back in a little bit later when we're on question time. Um, we will have a chat tonight going. So um, the chat can just be found at the bottom of the screen there. You can log into the chat and um, you can ask questions or give us your tasting notes and uh, so, yeah, get, take, take part in the tasting. Uh, tonight we've got uh, Andy uh, from, uh, I think Andy's in Melbourne at the moment, uh, he's the Spirits Platform representative. So uh, I am going to hand you over okay, Andy and then we'll um, introduce Chloe and then we'll get started and get into these whiskies because they smell amazing. So um, Andy, if you want to take over and uh, yeah. Um, awesome. Thank you very much, Craig. Um, thanks for putting this together. It's uh, fantastic to jump online and see some familiar faces again. Uh, Melbourne is opening up and there's a bit of confidence back in the industry. Uh, I'm, my calendar is starting to book out very, very quickly, which is exciting. And I'm going to get to go around and get to see everyone in person again and start to do these tastings face to face, which is fantastic. So um, first of all, as Craig said, if everyone can just chuck their uh, microphones on mute. Uh, that way we won't get interrupted as we go through. We've got a lot of information to get through, which we normally do with these brands. Uh, obviously, Brook Lady Distillery being about full transparency um, and some awesome things coming up that Chloe and I are going to discuss as we go through. So the order of the tasting today, uh, we're going through starting with the Classic Lady, then Brook Lady Bear Barley, Port Charlotte 10, Port Charlotte Isla Barley, then the Octomore 11.1, .1, and we're going to finish with something really special that Craig sourced for us, which is the Port Charlotte Valenche, which will be awesome. So uh, keep your microphones on mute as we go through. If you do have any questions, tasting notes, all that kind of thing, chuck them in the chat. I'm gonna be monitoring that. And then once we get to the Valenche, we're gonna open it up and everyone can unmute themselves and we can have a little chat about tasting notes, any questions you've got coming through. And then uh, hopefully we'll try and get through it all within three hours. I don't know if anyone's got anywhere they <laughs> really need to be. Uh, I think everyone's stuck at home but it's going to work out really well and be a fantastic tasting. So uh, I'd like to introduce Chloe Wood. I'm sure a lot of you have met her before, but it's great to have her uh, back online again with us to do this tasting. So Chloe is currently in Glasgow. Uh, she's the Asia Pacific brand ambassador for Brook Laddie and normally likes to come to Australia uh, every quarter, four times a year. Unfortunately, it's been a while since we've had her over, but uh, we've kept her busy doing these online tastings. So uh, I'm going to hand it over to Chloe now. Amazing. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Hope you're all doing well. There's a few brave faces on screen at the moment that have uh, put their camera on. Um, for those of you who haven't, I trust that you're not getting stuck into the whiskey already. Um, but yeah, thank you very much, Andy. I'm very excited to be back on screen doing a wee tasting um, for you guys here. And as I say, I'm coming from Glasgow, so it's an authentically Scottish day today, and it's great as anything. But hopefully, as uh, as we drink the whiskey, that will that will get better. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm kitted out. I'm ready to go. I mean, it is 11 o'clock in the morning here, and my apartment smells phenomenal. Um, so let's not dwell on that too much. And the rest of the meetings as the day goes on, I'm not gonna not gonna say how my day started. It's not not gonna lie. Um, I might get some questionable looks. Um, but yeah, it's it's gonna be a really exciting tasting. Um, as me and Craig were just saying, just prior to this, this is the first one that we've done virtually um, with these guys, the whiskey company. And we've got a cracking lineup for the evening. Uh, I think when Andy and I were discussing the whiskies that we're going to taste, it really takes us through the full journey of Brooklady, you know, starting with the Brooklady, Port Charlotte uh, and the Optimore as well. The only one we're not touching on is the botanist. But you may have had a botanist and tonic to start with. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Andy, have you? I've had a couple already. See? 
I knew it, I knew it. Again, if I said I had a couple, we would get some questionable looks because that is breakfast juice all the time, all the time. Um, but, you know, we'll run, run through these. We've got loads of things that we want to tell you about the products, about the distillery, kind of what's going on. Um, and as I said, open up a good Q&A at the end of the session. We'll jump on and we'll stay on uh, for a little while answering any questions you might have. Um, but as you go, you know, taste with us, enjoy the whiskies, And if you've got questions, uh, the guys from the whiskey company and Andy will all be keeping an eye on the chat. So if you do want to ask any questions about that specific product, more than welcome to answer them uh, as we go. And as always, it's great to hear your own tasting notes and your, your nose and notes as well, because we'll give ours, but it, you know, you get to hear some interesting ones. I think uh, we've both heard some great, what, great or crackers in the past. Huh? Um, so I think when we, when we start any tasting, it's probably good if we don't let me speak for the first half an hour without actually getting you to, to drink something. Um, so you guys can feel free to pour yourself the classic laddie as that'll be the first one that we're going to taste. Um, and while you're doing that, I thought, Andy, it might be quite nice to give a bit of a, a background on the distillery as well, a little bit of an insight into where we come from because um, maybe a lot of you will have been on a tasting with myself or Andy in the past or you may be a massive Brooklady fan but a lot of you might be new to the brand as well um so I thought we'd just do a bit of a background as well um but I think just to begin who would have thought that a year after the first lockdown in Glasgow I'd still be doing uh, virtual tastings you know as Andy said his calendar's opening up and he's getting back out in front of people I'm not jealous in the slightest, Andy. My goodness, how, how much would I love to It's reopening up now, aren't you, Chloe? What's that? Scotland's just reopening now. I've heard stories about the first night it was pouring rain and you're not allowed to drink inside the pub. So had all these punters outside drinking their pints out in the pouring rain just to be able to get back out and, and get back to it again. I believe that's called dedication to the cause. <laughs> Really, this is it. You know, there's no such thing as bad weather. You're just ill-equipped to deal with it. So pretty much all the outdoor, um, you know, all the hiking shops were just buying jackets, waterproofs, umbrellas. You know, there was no stopping a lot of people. As soon as the pubs were open, everyone was back out. Um, but yeah, there's there's some positive things happening. So hopefully in the coming months and, you know, that, that follow, we'll hopefully get, get on better as we go but yeah there's a, it's really lovely to hear that you guys are, are opening back up and things are, are kicking off again um, in Australia. One of my favourite Scottish sayings um, obviously penned by a very wise man a long time ago is to drink yourself a jacket and I've got a lot of Scottish friends that taught me that on some cold Melbourne nights uh, and it definitely works quite well especially with the lineup that we got tonight. Oh, yeah, I might take that into the weekend, to be honest with you. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. <laughs> no, that's fantastic. I think it's just having the, the freedom. And me, myself and Craig were saying, you know, it's just so strange to be able to do it um, and seeing people out and about, which is great. So I think hopefully we'll be able to do this in person at some some point down the line. But until then, I'm sure the lineup we've got will we'll see us through. Huh? That's right. Hopefully we can all get over there as well sometime soon. Exactly, exactly. So while you're having a little nose and a taste of the classic, I just want to say uh, thank you very much to all of you for joining tonight's tasting. Um, it's a real pleasure to be able to continue doing these virtually. And thanks to the Whiskey Company as well for pulling this together. Um, it's again, thank you for your continued support of Brocladi. So cheers, everybody, and hope you have a good evening ahead. Cheers. Oh, better than a morning coffee, better than a morning coffee. <laughs> okay, so uh, of course, we're, we're chatting all things Brooklady today, and that's going to take us through each of the, the brands under the house of Brooklady. Um, but for those of you who don't know, we are coming from the island of Isla, um, so the west coast of Scotland. And um, we've got a population of just over 3,000 on the island at the moment. But the more important fact that we'd love to state is that we have, of course, nine whiskey distilleries currently running on the island soon to be 10 um, but also going to be up to 12 in the coming years so you might have seen the new news about Port Ellen and then obviously the Gartbreck distillery and a few others in planning so 
there's certainly a lot of distilling history happening, but also the future for, for distilling is looking very bright and exciting for, for Isla. Um, what flavours might come from these new distilleries, it's, it's also quite exciting to see kind of the route that they go down, whether it's peated, unpeated, uh, and how they kind of challenge that, that kind of, I suppose, thought process behind Isla whiskey making. Um, but Brookladdy, just a wee bit of a brief history on us ourselves. So the Art Distillery had a very start stop life um, since it was built in 1881 and it was intended to supply spirit for blended malt. Um, but really the success of the distillery and that Victorian distillery has come in the last 20 years because it's been an unsuccessful distillery up until the restart in 2001. And really what myself and Andy will do is, is focus on like the last 20 years and also what we look to do for the future at the distillery because it's a really exciting time ahead with the whiskies that we're producing but also the kind of mindset that we've got at the distillery. So Mark and Simon who bought Brookladdy in 2001 tried to really turn this traditional Isla whiskey making on its head uh, and start something completely different, which hopefully you'll see through the whiskey uh, that we have in front of us. But they both wanted to bring this concept of terroir to whiskey, so coming from wine into whiskey, and it's something, it's a concept, especially with Australia, you guys, it resonates so well because it's all, it comes from wine, you know, it's about the locality, the place, the people, the ground, um, so really what we're trying to do is bring this sense of place and traceability back to the industry, which had really been replaced by profit and efficiency. You know, it was all about how much we could make with how little cost uh, and how kind of cost efficient it could be. So we do that, but we still manage to do it with the tools we have at the distillery uh, from potentially the 1800s, the early 1900s. So very much a Victorian distillery, but trying to be flavour first. It's all about flavour. So it's not about the yields, it's not about the figures that we can produce, but about flavour profiles uh, through from unpeated right the way through to, to super heavily peated. And that that has really continued since Remy Contro bought us in 2012. And um, we've really been able to step up this pace in this Isla first approach and Isla first mentality. So, you know, today when we start to chat about, you know, casks and transparency, barley and those varieties that we're using to some of the more crazy experimental releases, you can see just the kind of the real difference we want to make on what could be considered quite a stale industry within Scotland and Isla, but we want to kind of challenge that. So we'll take a look at understanding our terroir and provenance from whiskey and why things like sustainability is a massive uh, or key agenda for us at the distillery. Um, and of course, with Brookladdy, we don't just produce our unpeated range, but anything that comes under Brookladdy will always be unpeated single malt. Brookladdy, Port Charlotte, um, you have Port Charlotte being 40 parts per million, so you're heavily peated, and then Optimore being your super heavily peated. Um, and then, of course, we have the Botanist Gin, which is in a whole different league on its own, but just, good just to start. Just a little side project. Yeah, just, just a little global side project idea <laughs> for the Botanist. Um, but collectively, as a, as a whole, it's understanding that we're progressive Hebridean distillers, so making sure that we always are looking to try and try to challenge the convention um, with the way we produce spirits and the way we talk about whiskey, um, but also Hebridean, because it always relates back to place. It's always about Isla and how we can bring that to the fore. And because distilleries, you know, we're just making some amazing spirit that we're, we're excited to share with you. So enough talking, I would say, from my side. Andy, would you like to add on anything before we jump into classic and the, the taste profiles of it? Yeah, sure thing. Uh, I think it's important to point out that uh, we don't do anything by halves at Brooklady Distillery. You know, our gin is 46%, which I think is the lowest uh, spirit that we produce there. So all the whiskies that we're tasting today start at 50% ABV and get higher. So feel free to add some water while you're drinking if you do need to cut it back, if it does have a little bit too much alcohol burn to it. Um, you know, even dropping the classic laddie, that can, can bring out a lot of the light floral, you know, beautiful multi notes that are within it. Um, yeah. And, you know, drink some water as we're going through as well. I think um, just off the top of my head, I'm trying to count. I think we're having about eight standard drinks throughout this, maybe a little bit more. Um, so I hope no one's going to be operating heavy machinery later. Um, I'd definitely advise against that. But um, yeah, as, as Chloe said, you know, um, we're very progressive. We do 
respect the way that whiskey has been made in the past. In fact, you know, as Chloe said, we're still using equipment. Some of it was installed in 1881, uh, still going strong. Um, and, you know, we, we make it in, a, in an old fashioned way, but with a progressive look at everything. You know, we're, we're not a distillery that's run by accountants. Um, you know, some of the whiskey that we produce is, is uh, at least two times more expensive to produce than other distilleries. Um, but we produce it for the way that, you know, we'd want to drink a whiskey. You know, it's a, it's a distillery run by people that are fanatical about whiskey, not, you know, run by accountants that are looking for as much yield as they can get from the same type of barley that every other distillery is making. So, you know, definitely showing a, a pride of place on Isla. Uh, and then, you know, just a, a sense of being able to show that barley is not just a commodity. It's more of a, should be looked at as being a flavor ingredient as one of the raw ingredients of, of single malt whiskey. Yeah, yeah, I really, I really like that. And I do also appreciate the health and safety briefing before we, we kickstart the, the, <laughs> the multitude of drums for the, for the foreseeable. But it's an interesting point because we, we have a, a new brand manager just come on board and we were doing an induction the other day and chatting about these whiskies and like the philosophy at Brooklady. And really what became ever more apparent and when we chat about them is, you know, we've got all these stories in this kind of mindset behind barley, you know, looking at cast, sustainability. There's so many stories to kind of get through that the products are just that byproduct of the mindset, you know, so we're, we're making great whiskey, but with the mindset. And that's why it's changing uh, every time that we release a whiskey. It's designed to be different, you know, so we're not looking for consistency that every time you open a bottle of Brocladi, it tastes the same. Port Charlotte and Optimore. It's about that experimentation and doing something different. You know, we don't want it to be stale because that's just just not who who we are, I suppose. Um, and that leads us in to Classic Laddie very nicely. So I'm going to say on screen, I know a few of you may have opened a few Classic Laddies in your time. I'm not looking at it. I love the people that just smile there. You know who you are straight, straight away, straight away. And I'm always intrigued because John's on my screen and I wonder what he's going to be pairing Boilermaker wise tonight because he's always got some cracking stuff. So I'll need to need to follow that up after the, the tasting. Um, but yeah, we should definitely get into classic here. So when you're when you're tasting, oh, Craig's got it on screen there for anyone that doesn't see it as well. Um, so when you're nosing, when you're tasting, take your time tonight. Take your time nosing on the left, the right. Take your time when you're tasting really allowing that alcohol to sit on your palate for as, as long as possible, warming up these natural oils. And as Andy said, if you want to add a drop of water just to take any of that heat away and really open up these flavors, feel free to drop in a few drops. Um, there's no right amount of water to add. It's completely personal as well. Um, but yeah, classic laddie. So the, the island of Isla is definitely home to many famous Scotch whiskey distilleries. As, as you've mentioned, you know, we've got your fantastic Arbeg, Lefroy, Kilhoman, Bunahaven. Um, but many of these do produce a distinctly smoky spirit. So when we start introducing Brickladdy, conversely, this is always unpeated. So it's quite unusual to have an unpeated Isla. Um, but we believe that there's much more to Isla than the flavour profile provided by sourcing peated malt. So really for us, it's all about that exclusively Isla dist distillation, the maturation and bottling. That's what makes Isla whiskey and Isla. So classic laddie can uh, often be overlooked because it can be seen to be the, the entry whiskey to the distillery, you know. But actually the skill and the complexity that goes into making the classic laddie can um, can I almost be challenged to say this is the, one of the most difficult whiskies that Adam has to create time on time again, uh, because really the recipe is not set in stone. Although we know what the flavor profile should be of a classic laddie, um, how we make that is completely different. So whether we've used more wine, more sherry, more cognac styles of cast, more American oak styles of cast, it's gonna be different every single batch. But as long as the quality matches up, that's what we're looking for. So each batch of classic uh, will be unique and subtly different. And myself and Andy will take you through, you know, your batch code and see how, seeing what is exactly included in your classic laddie. Um, but ultimately, it's the head distiller who creates this co combination of the finest whiskies that we can source in the, the distillery to showcase this really classic, very floral, elegant Brooklady house style. 
Um, so if you are going to have classic, you know that it's going to be light, it's going to be elegant, it's fruity, it's floral, because it describes what we want to showcase as a typical Brooklady single malt, you know, so it's not going to be too barley driven, it's not going to be uh, too distillate driven, but it's that balance between distillate and cask influence on, on the classic. So just having a nose there, you've got an unpeated non-age statement or multi-vintage classic laddie. 50%, so you do get a little bit of that heat on the nose, you know, you can feel that influence of that, that ABV. But this is made with 100% Scottish malted barley, so it's worth noting that 100% of what we make at the distillery is made with 100% Scottish malt, and if it's not just mainland Scotland, it'll be from Isla, um, so we'll touch on that in a little bit there. Um, but yeah, on the nose, very light, floral, elegant. You can see that distillation influence come through. So you've, at the distillery, we've got these beautiful, really tall, slim neck copper stills. So we get that lovely citrus zest on the nose. So you've got that kind of lemon, kind of lemon peel influence. But then you get a little bit more honey and maybe a bit of orange influence. So it's really citrus, really sweet driven on the nose. But when you taste it, it's that combination of really amazing, that sweet oak, You've got that kind of honeysuckle, a bit of that toasted oak as well. And actually at the back of the palate, you start to get that malted barley influence. So that, that really kind of rich maltiness comes through. Um, but even at 50%, it's still giving you that elegant style of single malt, you know? So it's just showing you that whiskey doesn't need to be diluted. It's all about giving you this full flavor in as much, as much detail as we can. But Andy, what about yourself? Anything that comes to mind? Uh, yeah, I definitely get a bit of a, a saltiness to it as well. Um, mm. Probably more on the nose than what I do on the palate. Um, that yeah. comes from the fact that uh, for every single uh, cask of, of, of spirit that we have maturing, it's all maturing on Isla, um, right beside Loch Indale, which is an open water lock uh, where Brook Laddy Distillery is located. So it gets that beautiful you know, salt sea air spray, um, which comes and helps to interact with the barrel over the years of maturation. You know, you, mm. you lose a bit of spirit from the barrel, um, every year and it draws in a little bit of, of the air around it every year as well so it's got that little bit of saltiness to it um, you know whenever we do tastings a lot of people will try and tell us that it is peated just because of that higher abv the warmth from that um, the saltiness as well um, but you know it's definitely unpeated you know we've chloe and i've both been there when they've been producing it there's no peated malt that goes into it whatsoever but um, i think it you know it definitely helps being 50 percent abv because it mm. For that, you know, we're allowing you to do whatever you want to it. If you if we're doing a 40% whiskey, you can't really add water to it. Um, you can drink it at 50%. You can add some water to it to drop it back a little bit to make it a little bit more palatable, a little bit more easy to drink. But then, of course, being over 46%, we don't need to chill filter it either, which is something that's really important to us to produce an authentic whiskey. You know, we're not going to release it under 46% and have to strip out some of those beautiful oils and flavor compounds to, to stop it from going cloudy and, and flocking happening. Yeah, again, like driving that flavor, flavor first as well. You know, you can do all these things, but really why would we take away when we can just keep adding, adding to it? Um, so yeah, it's, it's a really, really elegant and very easy whiskey to begin uh, the tasting with. Um, and Adam Hannett is our head distiller. So he kind of worked under Jim McEwen for about eight years prior to getting the role of, of head distiller. And kind of his classic laddie again was to follow on from Jim's, but to create his own style, his own version of that. So really the ingredients for each classic um, being the casks will change from batch to batch, but Adam has to use his experience to attempt to recreate that flavor profile of Classic Laddie time and time again. So what I thought might be quite cool is to give you a bit of an insight into how he creates his batch. So as Andy said, we've got all these casks sat at the warehouse. Uh, we've got about 80,000 casks on site at the moment, and that is increasing every week, um, which is a great smell. It's one of the best places to, I'm going to say, Go in and, and really be at one with your thoughts, Andy. But obviously that just means when the warehouse boys are going through with the Valinch, you just follow them because you know that you're going to get some good some good whiskey. Um, but it's worth saying that this, this is such a difference, the fact that we store everything on Isla. It's not the case usually at all. Most distilleries on Isla will store in like Glasgow or Edinburgh, mainland Scotland, because 
it's again not cost effective to do so and a lot of the blending facilities are actually done on the mainland so really what we're looking at doing is having Isla the full maturation process so really when Adam goes to create classic we build the classic around American oak so giving you those beautiful caramel creaminess the vanilla creme brulee um, and then using European oak casks to, to elevate these subtle flavours, whether that's the citrus, whether that's that dryness, that bit of tannin. Um, and of course, the proportions are worked out in much smaller quantities. So Adam is taking maybe 150 mil samples and really vatting them together. Once the casks are selected and um, sent to the, to the team in the warehouse, they'll gather them as a whole, they'll vat them. And typically they're placed in what we call neutral casks for no longer than two months just to vat and just to marry together. Um, but these won't impart any flavor. It's just about kind of giving them time to settle um, in, the, in the what would be the bottle further down the line. And really we want to tell this to people, um, but of course with the Scotch Whiskey Association regulations, we cannot do it physically, um, but we can start to talk about it a lot more as time goes on because it's, a, it's definitely becoming a more open conversation. So when we create classic, you know, there's no shortcuts taken in its creation. So we've got no secrets to hide. And often people see that the classic doesn't have an age statement. And people say, you know, why are they not telling us this information? Are they trying to hide something about the, the way it's created? Um, but we've, we've done it in the sense that we've got this beautiful batch code for full transparency. So with this simple five digit code on the back of the bottle, um, so maybe even uh, if Craig's got that bottle there, Andy, you can even just type that into the chat so people can have a, have a go of maybe what they're tasting on this occasion. Um, but if you type that five digit code in, it'll give you a breakdown online of where the barley comes from, if it's Scottish organic, Scottish mainland, or Isla, because there is Isla barley included in it as well. Um, it'll also tell you about the cast types and the complexity of each batch. So on average, we have about 70 different, 70 casks to 100 casks for every vatting of Classic Laddie. Um, within that, there's a, a vast variety of flavours that can, can be created. And uh, what we'll show you on screen is the, the youngest vintage in the vatting, but of course we won't be able to disclose the oldest because of these, uh, these rules. But we're doing it in the most legal way as possible, but it's just showcasing, it's all about being transparent, giving you guys, because you're drinking it, you know, you should be able to know as much about the, the whiskey um, that, that, that we do when we're creating it. Exactly, you know, I think people are wanting to learn more about than just what the minimum age of their whiskey is. You know, you, you get a bottle and it's got a, a big 12 on it, you know that that's the younger whiskey that's gone into it, but you don't know anything about the makeup of the casks, the barley type. Well, obviously most distilleries don't want to tell you the type of barley because they're probably buying it in from Russia or another country that's making massive amounts of, growing massive amounts of barley over there because it's cheaper to buy that in. It has a bigger yield at the end of the day. So, you know, as I said, obviously run by counters, not run by whiskey makers. But, you know, I'm interested in putting into my body. So I look at the ingredients when I go and buy things from the supermarket. Uh, I want to learn more about what's in my whiskey, what's gone into to making that one up. And, and I love looking at the Brook Laddie, Classic Laddie recipe uh, every time I get a new bottle to, to see the makeup of the casks. And it's always interesting to go through. And, you know, obviously we can only tell you the age of the youngest cask under Scotch Whiskey Association regulations. And, you know, we have been fighting with them quite a lot over the past few years about this Laddie recipe. And, and we finally gone and, and, and redacted a lot of the ages of the older whiskies that have gone into it. And um, that's important with one of our recent releases we've done as well, um, which we might talk about a little bit later, uh, which is pretty exciting, the ternary. Yeah. Um, but, you know, this is, this is a really cool way of being able to see what Adam has to do. And, you know, I don't envy his job at all. It's probably one of the hardest jobs that he has within the whiskey industry as a whole, as a, as a head distiller is to be able to have to work with so many different styles of cast to try and get something that's consistent with the classic laddie. You know, you look at other distilleries, um, let's say Macallan, because, you know, I work for them as well here in Australia. They've got half a million casks maturing um, uh, up in Speyside, um, but they don't have as big a variation of types of casks. You know, we've got all these different casks that we're able to get our hands on from France because, you know, the French don't really like the English and the Scottish are guilty by association with that. So we're able to get all these amazing wineries to get casks that have come from there, um, you know, different styles of oak, cognac casks, 
um, you know, casks that have come from oriental places as well, which we're not allowed to talk about. Um, but yeah, we've, we've got all these amazing, <laughs> sorry, we've got all these amazing different types of casks, which is fantastic to see how our spirit matures in them. But poor Adam, he's got to try and get, you know, you can look at the different types of casks as being, you know, spices. And he's got hundreds and hundreds of different types of spices to try and get something, a really simple dish at the end of it. Whereas other, other distilleries have only got one or two spices to be able to blend together to get something really consistent. Did that make sense? Yeah, I got you. I got you. All right, cool. Makes complete sense. As long as everyone's with no. me. Yeah, it, it's really cool. Like it's, it's, it's about having, like as well for Adam, you know, he says as a head distiller, he can put his spin on on things because there's no set in stone recipe, you know. So it, it is about his creativity kind of coming through in the bottle as well, you know. And I think as a head distiller, having that flexibility is definitely appreciated um, on on his part. Um, but yeah, as Andy said, the the variety of casts in the warehouse, you know, whenever the time comes that you can visit Brickladdy and visit Isla when you walk through the warehouses, it's one of the most mind blowing things because you'll see some amazing French wines, you'll see some amazing Spanish wines, sherry cask, cognac, you know, we've got over 200 different varieties of oak sitting in the, the warehouses at the moment. And I, I think that says the level of, of potential creativity to, to come from a distillery like, like Brickladdy. Um, but I hope, I hope everybody's enjoyed the classic to begin with. Um, any tasting notes come through so far? Yeah, John's chucked one on saying green apples drizzled with honey, some maritime sneaks in, a little briny, barley sugar, yummy stuff. Um, nice. John's always good for some great tasting notes. Yes, that one. Uh, like and that. Anton said yummy stuff indeed. What a great way to start, which I absolutely agree as well. Uh, Chloe, just before we get started, I'm just going to share my screen and, and put in the code that Craig just put through for this um, yeah, classic lady great. that everyone's drinking. Um, actually, no, I can't do that because because Craig's disabled it. So I'm uh, I'm just going to go through. But what I was going to talk about was when I shared the screen is the first thing you see when you go to the Classic Laddie page on the Brook Laddie website. Um, if you're going to order something online from the distillery shop, there's a, a a tick box which you got there, which you can which comes ticked already, which says I don't want a tin, which is something that's really uh, exciting that we're doing at the distillery, which is our move towards sustainability, and we're actually taking away the we're not taking away your option. We, we're giving you the option to either have your bottle shipped with or without a tin. Because at the moment, the tins are, are made um, outside of, of Scotland and they're shipped over to Brooklady to have a bottle put in them and then they're shipped outside of the world. So essentially, we're shipping over these tins full of air over to Isla. It's taking up space on the Calmac ferry coming over. There's all these trucks shipping over empty tins. So we're looking at a way to be a bit more sustainable with that. And that's something that's really important to us as a distillery with all of our brands that we've got there and uh, something that's really exciting that we've just been uh, certified as B Corp. Um, Chloe's probably better to explain it than I am because I'll probably go off on a couple of rants with this one, but uh, Chloe, do you, do you just want to talk about the, the B Corporation certification that we've just received? Yeah, sure. Um, I think that's really, and again, with Australia, there's actually so many B Corp um, accredited companies in Australia. So it's probably quite a, a good market for us to, to talk about that kind of accreditation. Um, and yeah, you'll, you'll have seen that over our socials um, quite recently that we've, we've started to chat about B Corp a lot. And for anyone that, that doesn't know about B Corp, it's, it's an accreditation that kind of rates both the environment consumer standards and business uh, all on one level so usually like a business model would see profit at the top and people in pl planet would ultimately kind of be at the bottom whereas what b corp looks for is an even keel of people planet and profit so it's putting everything in, in an even line and within that it is one of the hardest accreditations to get so for us to, to achieve that we were the first um, whiskey distillery to do so in, in Scotland at that point. So there's only the other one um, that's just got accredited as Brewdog actually for their, their whiskies as well. So really good stuff coming from them. And it's really about, I think now there's probably just short of 4,000 companies globally that have got that accreditation. So, you know, it's it's not a massive amount. So we're very, very proud to, to have that accreditation. But for us, it's it's about cementing the work that we've done over the last 20 years um, and how we really push this forward. So we'll look at certain areas over the coming years and 
for the future because this isn't just something that we we get accredited and then it goes out the window we we always have to be working to get a better score so we'll look at like the um, energy that we use we'll look at packaging and waste and we'll look at the, the environment and agriculture and we'll also take into consideration um, our consumers and of course the distillery team as well so it's a bit of everything um, and then we get we get um, I suppose you could say like reassessed every three years but the accreditation starts at zero again so it's always making sure that you're pushing to do better uh, and like Andy said it's part of um, the sustainability and also the packaging and waste one tin lighter um, has been a massive, massive project. So when we launched it, it's not. We I think there was a fear that we we're just going to strip out the the idea of you could you could have the tin uh, or you couldn't. But this is completely up to you guys. It's just whether you want to come on this journey with us. Uh, and I'm just looking at the website now. We've just done two thousand one hundred and eighty-eight tins lighter so far since we launched that at the start of the year. So that is a lot of shipments to the island already, uh, which I think is a is a great achievement. So it's, it's yeah. probably a couple of truckloads, I think, of tins that at haven't least. had to get shipped over, yeah. which is fantastic. It's with with every truck less that we have on the ferry. Uh, obviously, with new distilleries opening, um, you know, as we speak. Um, there's a lot more infrastructure that's going to need to be brought onto the island. Um, some of them have to open by building more houses for their employees, which is something that's a bit of a problem at the moment, trying to find accommodation for everyone, uh, as, as we've found out with bringing more people onto the island to work at Brooklady. Um, so it's more trucks carrying, you know, more goods over there to build these distilleries. So the more trucks that are on these ferries means the less cars that are on there for tourism and tourism, people coming over to Isla for tourism spend a lot more money than what the truck drivers do. When they're coming on and off uh, the island, but yeah. I'm, uh, I'm just going to share my screen now to take you through the Brook Lady website with the classic lady. So as you can see there, we've got the I don't want a tin thing there, and you can always untick that if you still want to have your tin with it. Yeah. Um, but in the end, I find that people just end up using them to store coins or plant plant or to pot plants in. And then you just scroll down. You've got your Laddie recipe code, which you can find on the back of any bottle of classic Laddie. So click reveal and scroll down and it shows you the makeup of all the cast. So in this particular bottle that we're all drinking now, uh, it's batch number 164 from 2020. Um, it's a batting of 82 casks, four vintages, three barley types and 11 cast types that go through this. So um, there's a lot of information in here which would really appeal to the really nerdy whiskey drinker. Um, but you can scroll through here whenever you get a, your own classic lady and, and have a look in your own time. But it just goes through all the different types of uh, barley, Scottish mainland organic, which is something exciting that we do working with organic and biodynamic uh, farmers on the mainland. Um, what else have we got there? Andy, We've got barley I, grown at Isla as well. I think what's really cool, see if you go to the top of the, the, first, the first batch there, like this shows the complexity of, of a classic, that there's actually vattings of classic within a classic vatting. So it's not just like pulling one style of cast together, there's vattings pre-done before we make the final uh, final batch of classic, which is which is incredible. Uh, yeah, so we're not going to. We'll probably get tied down sitting here and talking about this page too much. So let's uh, let's keep going with the tasting. Yes. Yeah. I know. God, we need to remind ourselves here, otherwise we'll be here for four hours chatting. For one one hour per whiskey, Craig. Was that not what we said uh, said at the start? No. Um, but yeah, I think we should move on to dram number two. Um, if you haven't already, but we'll jump on and we're going to taste the Brooklady Bear Barley 2010. So um, when Craig, Andy and I had a, a quick chat pre setting up this, this one here, as soon as we said about including something from the Barley Exploration Series, I think Andy and I were just both like, can we, can we put bear in there? <laughs> it's definitely one of my favourites from the Brooklady lineup going into the, uh, the Barley Exploration. Every, I remember the first time I tasted it, um, many, many years ago. And, and I remember just the, the sensation I got uh, in my mouth. So wow. when we when we talk about whiskey, it's easy just to say the word smooth if it's like a really easy whiskey to drink. But a lot of people don't tend to talk about the sensation they get in their palates. And that's really going to make you sound like a more um, knowledgeable whiskey drinker is just moving away from that word smooth, but then talking about the, the sensation in your palate. And I remember, you know, I, I, I had, a, it was, I think it was my third dram for the night. And so I, I had a pretty good, pretty good go at it. Okay. And it as soon as it mixed in with my saliva it just you know just turned into this amazing velvet 
feeling throughout my mouth and just coated my palate. And I could taste it for, for five minutes afterwards. And ever since then, I've, I've fallen in love with the Bear Barley releases and always make sure I, I get a couple of bottles myself whenever they come over here. Um, but I think, Chloe, did we, is this the one that we had when we were out on that really on cold day um, on the boats traveling yeah. around? The 2010 oh, it's in, yeah it's incredible so we we have a, a brand ambassador summit um well usually every year but all you know of course that'll be when when we can all get together again and uh, yeah one of the days on isla we all got taken out on, on the speed boats up the kind of um east coast of isla so you can kind of um, sail by your lagavulin lafroy guard beg and we parked outside um i think it was probably parked outside lagavulin and we cracked open yeah. a brick and we cracked open a brocladi just to prove a point, you know. So <laughs> it was it was a fantastic kind of boat trip, but it was the beer barley 2010. And you know, these memories, like whenever I drink it, I'm the same. It kind of comes back to that memory of, of that day. Yeah? We we were on the same boat. It was the open air one, wasn't it? That was just mm. so cold. And we're in these orange jumpsuits to try and stay dry and, and stay warm, but it just didn't work with the uh the waves coming off the Atlantic Ocean going around the side of of Isla and, and seeing the most amazing site, which was deer swimming, which I would never have imagined if you had told me about it. But um, there's some islands off the coast, which are called deer islands. Is that right? They, where the yeah, deer yeah, swim yeah. out to them and, and do that. So I that's uh, definitely something you need to try and do if you, mm. when you get over to Isla is go and watch the deer swim yeah. and have a brook lady off the honest. coast of uh, Lagavulin. Yeah, yeah. I think, to be honest, people questioned how much whiskey they had when they did see deer swimming across, across the water. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's a real experience. And I think like whiskey is, is about that. It's about these experiences that you just remember and it kind of puts you back into, into one of those, you know, and Bear Barley certainly does that for me. Um, but honestly, uh, Bear Barley for me, this release and any of the others from the Bear Barley series, have been like my go-to drams since the first taste. Um, I've definitely got a few sample bottles in the cupboard, which I'm going to say are solely for education purposes only, but really they are like the go-to dram, you know. Classic for me is like, it's always going to be up there, but this one, because of how limited they are, they're just they're just super special whiskies. Eh? Yeah, that's right. So um, to fill everyone in, if you're not sure, uh, Bear Barley is a, is a very... Um, it's about a 500 year old style of barley, uh, which they believe that most barley varietals or modern varietals have come from over the years. And it's been cultivated for hundreds of years uh, on Orkney, which is a, a group of islands off the north coast of Scotland, which is inhabited by Vikings for about 800 years um, earlier on in the, in the millennium, last millennium. Um, and it was a, a really interesting, um, it's, a, it's a six row style of barley. So most styles of barley you see are two rows. So this has, has six rows of the actual grains growing on it. Uh, and it grows a lot higher. And with the extra weight, by the time it's time to harvest, it's almost falling over on itself. Um, but um, Chloe, do you want to talk about the first time that it got mashed? <laughs> yeah, to... I mean, yeah, it certainly is. Like, I think Andy's kind of teed it up there nicely. You know, the fact that with bare barley being that six row, um, it grows really well in like marine conditions as well. So on kind of like sandy kind of earth. So beside like the kind of macker, you would say. So that's why Orkney is, is taking it on. Um, but it's it's a variety that's kind of since been forgotten in the modern world of whiskey making because the yields aren't great. Um, it's not the easiest crop to work with. It's not the easiest crop to grow. But when you taste it, you know, that's why we work with a crop like bear. And, um, it's such a resilient crop that it's really important to keep this strain alive. You know, it's been around for so long that we should pay kind of a tribute by showing it the respect that it, it deserves. So its restoration has taken a lot of work from all parties involved, from millers to growers and farmers, um, but also making this a profitable experience from both a monetary point of view and a sustainable one. It's taken a while, you know, to get this back in back in kind of whiskey production. Um, so for us, Bear Barley is, is is dedicated to those that have managed to kind of keep on pushing forward, whatever the odds. Uh, but it certainly helps when a product that is produced and tastes like this comes of something like Bear Barley. Um, so yeah, we know that the the six row um, head on it 
means that it's it's not the traditional two, but it actually means that the grains are much smaller. Um, and because the grains are smaller, they've got much less carbohydrate, so much less fermentable sugars, which means much less alcohol. So the yield is not as big, but again, flavor um, is all about that going forward. And what Andy was referring to with the, the mash tun there, um, we did grow a batch on the island, um, on Isla, we don't do it anymore. We also continue to, to source it from, from Orkney. And traditionally our batches at the distillery are seven ton mashes. So they're quite hefty, but for the Victorian equipment, the mash tun dates back to 1881 as well. It's enough. And for beer barley, we decided to use seven tons as well. So just the normal mash. And it basically came to light very quickly that this wasn't going to end the way that we wanted it to. As soon as we added the first water, it just started to stick together and it went like clay almost in the mash tun. So almost like a cement trying to get mixed around with this old equipment. And very soon after, you could just hear it snap, break, pops of noises in this mash tun um, and it actually completely destroyed the, the 1881 mash tun that had been in place without fail since it's in, uh, building back in the 1800s uh, but I should point out that the guy that was in charge of it again I always make a point of this he still works for the distillery so he wasn't sacked on the spot <laughs> he's managed to keep his job there um, but we realized you know that grains work differently and um, you know we need to understand how to work with them throughout the production so so now we have to dial it back and we only can mash 5.5 tons a batch. So we're having to, to really dial that back. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's an amazing thing to, to just see how differently grains work, Andy. Yeah, yeah that's right. Um, uh, we won't mention the rye at all, um, but we do have a few tasting notes from the bare barley that I'm going to run through now. So remember, keep putting your tasting notes on there because it's really interesting to see uh, different flavours and aromas that, that people get. And everyone does have a different palate. It comes from your memories. You know, if you've never had vanilla ice cream before, you're probably never going to be able to pick that kind of flavour up. Um, I'm a big fan of chocolate. So I get chocolate and whiskey quite a lot. In fact, I do a lot of tastings with whiskey and chocolate, which work really well together. So that's a little tip for you in the future. Um, so we've got, Erin uh, has said it's got, she gets a big earthy note on the nose of this one. Yeah, nice. Like uh, David says a strong vegetal barley note. Uh, mm -hmm. John, um, much better palate than me. He gets coconut water, porridge with pear compote, lemon zest, and a hint of fennel. Then Terry yeah, says a lingering taste, musty, reminds him of dark chocolate and blue vein cheese taken off a platter. And Mufasa gets a lot of aniseed with this one. Nice. Yeah, that's amazing. It's really great to hear all these because it's so personal for these tasting notes and, and nosing notes as well. But yeah, keep keep them coming. Um, so yeah, while you, while you're continuing to taste, um, the beer barley is obviously the 2010 edition that we're tasting today. So when it says 2010 on the label, this is the year of distillation, but it's actually a 2009 harvest from Orkney grown barley. Uh, so this one is matured fully in ex-American first fill bourbon casks um, for a minimum of eight years. And the reason we keep it to eight is so that we taste the distillate, taste the malt. Um, if we start getting that to 10, you know, 15, 20 years old, you start to get cask dominant flavored whiskey. And it, for us, it's about she seeing the difference vintage on vintage, year on year, and the difference in growing location as well. So um, again, non-chill filtered, coloring free and 50%. Um, yeah, I, I get a lot of those notes coming up. I love the idea of that coconut, the malt, the aniseed of the nose. I get a lot of kind of like that really oaty, very uh, kind of like cereal nose on the note myself because of that barley influence straight away. And then when you when you taste it, yeah, super oily, which I think is really exciting. You can really taste and feel that oil coming through from the distillate and, and the cask. Um, but yeah, pear and apple for me all the way through on bare barley um, is really exciting. A go to. It'll always be a favourite. I could sit on this for a long time and just chat about beer barley. Um, but what I thought might be quite nice, um, because we chatted a bit about, you know, B Corp, we chatted a bit about, you know, your um, one tin lighter. I thought with sustainable agriculture, beer barley is at the heart of that. You know, it's all about kind of keeping these kind of long forgotten varieties moving forward. But also, how can we really benefit the farmers on the island? And also, how can we look at kind of bringing this into our day-to-day -day routine. So uh, a few of you might have 
noticed online um, back in 2018, we actually bought Shorehouse Croft, which is right beside the distillery. And Andy's going to smile because we've been fully involved with the planting of these, uh, these barley varieties uh, at the island. Um, but this is just a really small plot of land of 30 acres right beside the distillery, which will ultimately be used as like an unofficial uh, R&D site, but it'll ultimately benefit our kind of agricultural in-house expertise into sustainable agriculture, which is quite exciting. So in that plot of gra uh, ground, we've actually planted 64 different barley varieties and 27 of wheat. Um, which work along the Bread Lab in the US and the James Hutton Institute and the UHI, so University of Highlands and Islands. And it's all about understanding what we can do on Isla to move kind of barley farming forward. You know, what can we grow? What the yields will be like? What the land will be suitable for? And yeah, when Andy was last on Isla, I think that was the last trip, we were all, we were all over trip, yeah. there. Yeah, so we, we were actually, given the responsibility of planting these new barley varieties and uh, wheat strains, which, yeah, more fool them, you know, I think there's going to be like an interesting growing pattern going on in some of the fields, <laughs> for sure, but really exciting to see kind of this mindset changes, and again, not just about how we can make whiskey as a kind of yield benefiting, but again, what flavours can we really find, it's, it's really exciting. Yeah, it was it was funny to see all these brand ambassadors coming from everywhere around the world to to go to Brooklady and, and do the brand camp, and then all of a sudden we're we're out in the field in our wellies and um, which is what we call gumboots in Australia. I uh, just thought I'd keep it uh, on brand with uh, with with the UK. Um, having to get out there and you know having to get dirt under their fingernails and, and dig out these plots of these. I think they were two meter by one meter with yeah. with each different barley and wheat varietal to see how would it grow on Isla because. You know, up until 2004, you know, barley wasn't grown on Isla for, you know, big whiskey production. Uh, so, it's, you know, it's something that we're doing and, you know, it was an experimental thing to do back then. You know, over the years, we've had 20 different farmers, I think, grow barley for us on Isla um, for producing whiskey, which is amazing. And, you know, I'm just hold up the, the bare barley bottle here. Um, this isn't Isla, this is Orkney, but we actually put all the farms that grow for us for this vintage on the label. So, you know, they get to a bit of show and tell to show that they've got a, a whiskey that just contains barley that they've grown. So it's a bit of ownership for the farmers as well. And um, I, I think that's really exciting. But, you know, in the end, we when we plotted, planted all these plots of barley and, and wheat on uh, on the croft, we thought we'd do the right thing and, and do it without any fertilisers and, and without any artificial kind of things being put onto it. And, and in the end, from that bit of land being over farmed for the last probably 50 years, uh, we didn't get many results from from uh, what was grown on there. Yeah. I think uh, yeah. most of them died without uh, having any artificial fertilizer put on them. Yeah, yeah, and again, it, like you say, it's 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 really great to be a part of that and kind of see the story progress because, you know, we were we were seen to be these pioneers back in two thousand and four with starting to grow barley on the island, you know, for whiskey making, and there's still only one other distillery growing barley on Isla, which is the wonderful Colhomen, you know, which have got some amazing releases coming out. Um, but yeah, to, to kind of push that forward once again, see how many more farmers we can get on board. I think last year we totaled just over 50% of the, the annual use of barley coming from the island itself, which is which is incredible as well. So there's some amazing things going on from just even just a barley planting and growing um, point of view at the distillery. Um, and it's not to say that we won't ever grow bare barley on the island again, but um, at the moment, Orkney is, is the place for it. But yeah, we should probably mention, um, of course, we have rye as well growing on the island, um, which is very exciting. There might be a, there might be a release coming out of, at some point in the near future with that. So again, I said to Craig, I'll get in trouble if I say too much, but I love saying this kind of stuff. So it's, it's uh, the balance between the two, but Andy's tasted it. It's, it's, uh, he can vouch for it, I'm sure. All right. So will we move on to the next whiskey? Yes, yes, definitely. I think it's a good segue talking about growing barley on Isla and then moving into Port Charlotte. And, uh, mm. and especially with you talking about, you know, over 50% of our barley that we used last year um, was grown on Isla. And it's definitely something that we've had to look at as a sustainability thing because we don't use any of the maltings. We don't use the AGA maltings on Isla. We have to ship our barley that's grown on Isla 
off to the mainland. Well, first of all, it gets dried at, at Chloe's dad's farm. An Octofad farm gets dried out for, uh, for shipping. It gets shipped off the island over to Beds in Inverness, the mopses that we use for all of our whiskey. Uh, it gets malted and then shipped back to the island. So it's, uh, it's definitely not a, a really sustainable practice to be doing that. You know, we're looking at our carbon footprint. So it's, uh, it's something that's really exciting that we've got coming up in uh, 2020, what's the official date now? 2023. So in two years time, we will have our own maltings on Isla. It's kind of going to complete that part of the puzzle for us for 100% Isla uh, whiskey that we produce there, uh, which is really exciting. But then it's also another uh, problem that's, that's come into itself with the extra amount of energy that's going to be used to malt barley on Isla. So um, that's where we're looking at a lot of other sustainable options, a lot of green power, you know, tidal wind power, because sitting off the west coast of Scotland, we've got the Atlantic Ocean, we've got the Gulf Stream, which comes up. So there's definitely two things that we're not lacking on Isla, and that's wind and, and tidal power as well. Yeah, for sure, for sure. It's a, yeah, it's a really exciting time. And I think like the, the reason that Andy's kind of touching on all these things is, the, the messaging that we're really pushing with Port Charlotte is this kind of we are Isla movement, you know, and it's chatting about what Isla means to us as a distillery for, for a brand like Port Charlotte, but also what Isla means to you guys as drinkers of Port Charlotte as well. So, um, yeah, as, as we go through the Port Charlottes, I think uh, it's going to be a real discussion point. So I'd love to hear any kind of feedback or anything like that. Um, but I think, Andy, we're there's a few comments there about which Port Charlotte we're going to taste next, but we're going to go Port Charlotte 10, Ten is it? Yeah, yeah PC 10, 10 first. first. So we'll start with the Port Charlotte 10 because this is like the, the core of the Port Charlotte range. Um, so for anyone that's kind of just coming into Port Charlotte, Port Charlotte will always have at least three whiskies. Um, so you'll have the Port Charlotte 10 being the core, Port Charlotte Isla Barley being the, the limited edition in the, the kind of core range. And then you've got the cask exploration. So uh, we did have the MRC, we did then have the OLC, and we have now the PAC. So clues, anyone can uh, figure those uh, <laughs> acronyms out, wishing you the best. But um, yeah, we'll jump Before in. anyone asks, we, the PAC is coming over. Um, it's currently stuck in the Suez Canal waiting to, to make its way through. <laughs> Uh, but we will be getting to Australia quite soon, um, you know, as long as shipping starts to improve itself a bit. Yeah, we were saying just before we jumped on that pretty much just the shipments were just full of brocladi. That's what sunk them, <laughs> sunk them to the bottom. Um, they are coming. It's on route. It's on route. Um, I just saw a comment pop up there. Any word on when we will see MRC again? So the, the cask exploration series are actually limited editions or limited series. So once they're done, we won't bring them back officially. In the flask of the captain. Oh God, Craig, don't don't be saying that. That that's taking a different turn. Um, so we won't bring them back as the MRC01, but they may be included in additions moving forward. So they might have an MR cask involved um, further down down the line as well. Um, but these ones all like so the PAC will come out. It's it's been released, but when it gets released in Australia, uh, once it's done, it's done. But we might bring something very similar or very different out for the, the next batch for sure yeah, but yeah. So definitely keep an eye on the uh um whiskey company website because uh it'll definitely be going to to craig uh as one of the first lots that comes over to australia because craig uh with the whiskey company is a uh brooklady authorized reseller so he gets the first dibs and and, and big allocations of it as well so definitely Fantastic. keep an eye out for that I think Paul's got one on screen there. I think I saw an MR, MRC. Yeah, I thought it would be the 2010. Well done, well done. Amazing. Um, so yeah, we'll jump on to Port Charlotte. Um, of course, when you think of Isla whiskey, the, um, or when you think of Isla whiskey, I feel like there's background music for the Port Charlotte kind of coming in there. That was a kind of drum and bass style kind of happening in the back. Um, with Port Charlotte, um, we, when we think of Isla, we think of whiskey. When we think of the Isla whiskey, it's typically peated. And that really kind of iodine or that medicinal smoke that you typically get with your brands like Lagavulin, the Froig, or maybe Ardbeg. Um, but with Port Charlotte, we wanted to give you a very different take on heavily peated Isla single malt. So before we jump into the taste notes officially, what I'd love you guys to just have a nose, have a taste and see what you guys get because a lot of the time when we do these tastings you know Andy or I 
may give you some notes or, or taste profiles that we find or that you know maybe have come up in the official tasting notes that Adam kind of is wanting us to taste but actually that can sway your decision almost because you kind of got that at the front front of your mind and you know I remember I was doing this tasting on Isla once and it was just this this group that you know every time I'd said a tasting note they were like oh yeah I get that I get that um, but actually, then I just said, you know, this time you'll taste like strawberry bubble gum, and everyone's like, oh yeah, I taste strawberry <laughs> bubble gum, you know. And they're like, I, I often say marshmallow, and a lot of people go, yeah, I, I get marshmallow now. It's a it's a subjective thing. Exactly, exactly, and you, you know, you're more swayed to whatever we take because it's so like this is one of the hardest parts for Adam as well is smelling and tasting a whiskey, but putting that into words. And it, like John, your taste notes are always really amazing just to just to hear them because it's very difficult to you know, have a smell or have an aroma and a taste and then put that into writing because you have to use these memories and bring it to life that way. So yeah, phenolic candy floss. Oh, there we go. Maybe, maybe we need some more. Maybe you guys, you want a job at the distillery writing our taste notes? There you go. There's there's a new one right there. Oh, I, um, I don't know. Jim used to have some pretty good tasting notes if you go through oh, some of the older releases. You know, Fisherman's Wet, Wellington Book, you know, that was always an interesting one to explain, you know, because everyone has them on their, their palate daily. So, it's, yeah, you get some interesting ones for sure. Um, but, yeah, some really cool stuff. And did you want to pick out a few that we've got? We've got, oh, there's uh, Candy Flood Airy, I like it. Yeah, there's some good ones coming in. And I think with Port Charlotte, you know, it's always peated to 40 parts per million. Uh, it's got that beautiful smoky peaty characteristic that Isla is, is renowned for but again it's it's slowly and it's trickle distilled not triple so not three times but trickle so nice and slowly distilled and these same stills that we distilled Burkladi and Octomore um, so you still get that lightness you still get that elegant style of a heavily peated whiskey um, so the Port Charlotte 10, uh, 10 years old between American oak first fill at 65% of this batting um, so giving you that kind of, again, that creaminess, that caramel, really honey influence. But we also use 10% second fill American oak, and that allows this smoke to come through a little bit easier on the palate, but still giving you that sweetness. But I think the real kind of palate changer here is the fact that we use 25% second fill French red wine casts. And what that does is it gives us that lovely dryness at the back of the palate. So that on the nose, we get a real dry, earthy peat smoke, but we also get that kind of salted fudge. So it's that combination between sweet and salty, bit of that hint of ginger coming through, so that spiciness. And then when you taste it, it's got that delicacy, it's got that softness and the, the texture and the style. Uh, but for me, it's all about coconut and that lemon honey once again coming through, um, but super, super oily as well. What do you think, Andy, on you? Yeah, definitely. Like, you know, I, I love it. You know, I, I get a lot of campfire barbecue style smoke um, mm. with, the, with the malt that we get. Um, you know, it's, it's definitely got that kind of that fruity characteristic at the, at the finish from the red wine casks. Um, but if anyone's wondering why we use first fill and, and refill uh, bourbon casks is there's two things within the whiskey production that's really going to affect the amount of peat that you get on the on the finished whiskey and uh the two that probably affect it the most would be where you take your cut points with your spirit uh phenolics are very heavy molecules and they come out later in your cut points so if you take them earlier it's not going to be as peated as what you'd kind of expect it to be and then maturation as well as chloe said earlier once whiskey start to get over eight years old they start to take on more of the cast characteristic and that oak's going to overpower the malt the malt being the, the barley flavours and then also the, the peat that's in it as well. So by using a refill cask, it's not going to influence the, the spirit too much and it's going to allow the spirit to shine through a little bit, little bit more. Yeah. yeah, and I think, you know, there's still this misconception in the industry that, you know, anything bar a first fill isn't, is inferior, you know, but actually we use these to benefit the flavour of the distillate more than anything. So it's even like if you go back to Brafladi or unpeated spirit, a lot of the time, if we were to put that, say, in like first fill sherry or first fill cognac casks, 
it would just overpower the spirit straight off. So using like these second or third fill casts really helped to balance um, balance these flavor profiles. But it's worth noting that at the distillery, you know, we try and pay a premium on casks because we want as best quality as we can, but we don't use a cask more than three times at the distillery for, for maturation. So after that third use, we'll probably sell it back to somebody like Speyside who will then probably break it down make it sure the charring level is correct and then sell it on to, to somebody else. Um, but it's all about, you know, full flavour. Whiskey doesn't need to be older. You know, I think we've shown that in the first three whiskies. You don't need to leave it 15, 20, 30 years for the flavour to be there. If you make a good, well, start with great barley, you have a great distillation, a slow distillation, and then the casks are, are as quality as we, we can source as well. So, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. We've got some great, some great uh, tasting notes coming through. Uh, Paul says salty yeah. popcorn at a bonfire. I love that one, hundred percent. I get that. Yeah. Um, Aaron says I like the smoke hit up front, which transforms into sweetness. Um, nice. Chris says aftertaste and smell of toasted coconut or even Anzac biscuits. Um, John, we'll, we'll always touch on John because he <laughs> gives such great ones. Um, he goes, this yeah. is such a classic Peter Daily Dram. Um, I love that Daily Dram because. Uh, I'm not sure how many people are on Facebook. I'm sure most of you are. Um, but, you know, Australian Whiskey Appreciation Society and all those kind of ones, Port Charlotte 10 has just been getting so many great raps on, on, these, on these social channels lately because it is, you know, such a great daily drinker and a, a really good go-to. You know, I, I do it quite often. Um, I, have it, I use it for a highball during summer. Um, it's a great way to still get your drams um, without having anything that's too heavy. Um, so it really is, is, is a great daily dram. Um, to go on with John's, peat smoke is definitely there, but there's heaps of spice, cinnamon and cloves, vanilla, yeah. gingerbread, lemon rind, and earthy notes like mushroom. But I've got to touch on David's comment, and uh, he's, he's censored a couple of words in there, which I first thought were swear words, and I thought he was, you know, using like the F word <laughs> or something like that, which a lot of people do when they're talking about whiskey, when they get really into it. Um, but the word he was uh, censoring was Ardbeg, I'm guessing. Um, so he said initially thought it was an Ardbeg 10 on the palate and then bare barley vegetal notes, then back to Ardbeg again. And please don't feel like you need to blank that out because, you know, we're, yeah. you, we, we look at the other whiskies that are being made on Isla and, you know, there's, there's no bad whiskies being made on Isla. You know, we, we love them all and we're just making something that's a little bit different, a little bit, you know, kind of more thought provoking. But what I love about that is, the PC10 is a bit of an ode to the other whiskey distilleries on Isla making heavily peated whiskies. Because if you look at most of them, most of them, their core whiskey is a 10 year old. So that's why I've gone for a 10 year old as well. But, you know, we've, we've tried to make it a little bit more progressive. You know, it's a, definitely not a, a traditional whiskey uh, yeah. bottle that we, we, we're using with this. In fact, you know, this was designed in house, uh, took three years from start to finish, from concept to to be able to fill it with whiskey as well. We like to do everything in the house. We've got our own marketing teams. Um, but, you know, this is a, a little bit of an ode to the way that whiskey has been made on Isla, but just done in a progressive way, the progressive mm. in distiller way. Yeah, no, it's a really good point. And, you know, I think, you know, when each of the distilleries on Isla will speak, you know, they'll speak so highly about their own distillery, but also about one another because we are such a small island. You know, it, you, it doesn't pay to, to do it any other way because, for us, every distillery is completely, completely unique, and we're just, we're just very lucky to to be able to talk about what we do because we we have full control of it at our distillery as well. Um, and with Port Charlotte, it's it's a way to just bring something new to the table in that kind of traditional Isla whiskey mindset. And yeah, it's it's been around in in their distillery. A few of you might not know, but a lot of people think we started with unpeated back in 2001 but actually the first distillation uh, back in 2001 was actually a port charlotte so it was it was peated malt that we distilled at the distillery first and over the years you know it's kind of gained so much momentum as a as a brand and it's really only like in the last three that we've really seen port charlotte take this whole new lease of life because it used to be bottled in the, the similar style bottle to the classic um and the the, the isla barley the bear barley and that oslo glass so yeah since 2018 we got a new bottle we get like this new lease of life for for port charlotte and yeah, some talking points are, are incredible about what makes an Isla whiskey an Isla whiskey. It kind of had that middle child syndrome, you know, same bottle yeah. as Brook Laddie. Um, you know, everyone loved Brook Laddie from, from being such an elegant dram. 
Um, and then obviously, you know, we've got Optimal, which we're going to later, you know, definitely being that kind of cult whiskey that, that mm. it is. Um, but the, the Port Charlotte kind of, yeah, it was just sat in the middle and, you know, we, we didn't produce a lot of it, but, but since the Port Charlotte 10's come out, the new bottling, yeah. uh, it's been doing absolutely amazing things worldwide. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, put it into perspective, last year we, we hit the million litre mark. So that's what we're, we were producing at the distillery last year. And 50% of that went to Brooklady. So you're unpeated but 40% actually went to Port Charlotte. So you can see that swing uh, in how our production styles have changed. Yet still 10% goes to Optimore because that's the, the very limited um, edition or series that, that we do have. Um, so yeah, Port Charlotte is it's a really great brand and the, the whiskies that are coming out are amazing. But I do think it's worth noting, like Adam has all this selection of casks, all these selection of whiskies at the distillery. Yeah, he says one of his favorite go-to daily drams is Port Charlotte 10, you know, and I think that says that says it all. It's just such an easy drinking whiskey, um, but your classic Isla turned on its head. But on that note, what we should do is probably challenge this against the, the Isla Barley version of the Port Charlotte, because what you guys have got today is the Port Charlotte Isla Barley 2012, which is the newest vintage of Isla Barley. So really exciting to, to hear your guys' feedback on this one because it hasn't been out so long. Yeah, and then again, with this one being the, the 2012, it's the year of the distillation. Uh, so a lot of time, if it's, Chloe might correct me with this, if it's springtime barley, it'll get, Got to think because it's backwards to our seasons. It gets planted in springtime, harvested six months later, and then distilled yeah. just the next year. Is that right? So it'll be harvested yeah. in 2011, but then distilled in 2012. Correct. Yeah. There is sometimes that it will be harvested, say, like harvested and distilled in the same year, but it just, if it fits in with the production schedule, it may work in that way. But more than not, it'll be the year after the, um, that we distill it at the distillery. Yeah. So if anyone had a, a kid that was born in 2012, just uh, make sure you pick up a, a couple of bottles of this for when they turn 21. Absolutely. There you go. Just like that. Just dropping that in there. And then, you know, <laughs> bring it back. Um, but it is true that if you do like things like the Isla Barley 2012, the Bear Barley 2010, these whiskies, they won't be around forever because they're signifying a snapshot in time. This is about one vintage harvest, one vintage year. And once it's done, we actually physically can't replicate that. We may plant the same barley variety in the same field, but it may grow differently. It may have different weather. It may pick up different nutrient in the soil. So every variable will be there. There might be a different distiller who distills that when it gets to the distillery, a different maltman. So everything is gonna be different. And that's why whiskey, again, you could say it's eight years old, but actually if we go by vintage, it tells you much more about the growing season that it might have had in place. Exactly. And, you know, winemakers in France and, and cognac makers have known this for, for hundreds of years that, you know, and they use a word terroir, which doesn't really have a great, you know, instant translation into English, but it, it, it goes on to say that, you know, each year the, the grapes are going to be different. That's why wines um, do, do, um, do vintages. Uh, and, and wines will change from the same plot of, of grapes every year, um, according to their growing seasons, the nutrients in the soil, um, the climate, microclimate, who picked them, you know, who got their feet dirty and squashed them. And then the winemaker in the end is all going to affect how the wine is. And, you know, it's easy to see with wines, especially if you're a, a big Australian red drinker. You know, you can see that a Shiraz is different from Heathcote, different to the Barossa, different to uh, Margaret River. Whereas Barley's not really looked at it like that when we're talking about scotch whiskey production and you know we're challenging that whole perception and saying well yeah well barley is different that's grown on mainland scotland to uh to isla and then even within you know different growing seasons it's going to change as well so that's what i you know absolutely love about these isla barleys yeah agreed and i think you know when we start to chat about isla um it's definitely become this renowned word within the whiskey industry and this home of peated whiskey. Um, and I suppose one of the most unique whiskey regions in Scotland as well, that's known all over the world. But a lot of the time people assume that Isla is the kind of center for all Isla whiskey that's produced. Um, but 
really it does challenge it when it comes to the whiskey origins sorry origins the ingredients to production and the maturation so like andy said we just want to try and challenge the concept of what is an isla whiskey um and what it can be so of course you have the port charlotte 10 coming in there um and this kind of cemented this we are isla mindset and and philosophy from us as a distillery but really we kind of wanted to take it a step further and when you start to chat about isla whiskey to be called an Isla whiskey, the only thing that it needs to happen on the island is it, it needs to be distilled. So, you know, we can buy barley from anywhere in the world, have it malted anywhere, bring it to Isla to be distilled, but then matured, bottled and using water from anywhere in Scotland. You know, there doesn't need to be that connection to Isla to call it an Isla single malt. Whereas when we look at Brickladdy, Port Charlotte and Optimore, we're doing all those things um, within Scotland, first of all, but if not, Isla for sure and like Andy said the maltings will come in 2023 um, and we'll start to kind of emphasize as much Isla as possible moving forward because we really want to showcase like this testament to the distillery testament to the Isla people and the Isla place and the name that comes with it. So uh, Port Charlotte Isla Barley isn't just another product, um, but it's a, I suppose it's like a, a celebration of the farmers that have managed to produce this barley, uh, the land that they work with, um, and they, they kind of managed to grow this barley in. Um, and it's a dram that we can be super proud of that we can release because there's not anybody else doing something like it. And again, Cohoman released that beautiful 100% Isla bottling, which if you haven't tasted it, definitely give it a go but very different flavor profile once again. So even doing them side by side can be, can be quite interesting. Um, but yeah, this, this whiskey here, as you say, grown in 2011, distilled in 2012 from eight Isla farms on the island. Uh, as Andy said, on the front of that label, you'll actually be able to pinpoint those farms locations. So um, central and Western farms really. Um, for this one here, it is, matured for um, a combination of both 75% first fill American whiskey casks and 25% second fill wine casks uh, for this one. But on, on the nose, um, we get a lot of that beautiful lemon coming through again, real influence of that green fruit. Um, but lots of vanilla actually for me on this one. Like yeah, like creme brulee color. kind of vanilla I get. Yeah. Just kind of sitting above at the top. Every, once you get through that smoke, it kind of just sits there and yeah. yeah, I think as well, the fact that it's again a younger whiskey, you know, you're typically smelling a lot more of that, that distillation, whereas the first fill American oak is just starting to come through as a top note of that vanilla. Uh, but when you taste it, um, I remember when I tried it first, like milk chocolate was one of the things that came through, loads of almond, uh, and you get, it's actually one of the Port Charlottes that you do actually get a hint of that iodine note, I think, coming through just slightly, but it, it's definitely there for me anyway. On the palate, I get a lot more spice right up the front. Like it's really aggressive and I tend to get that a lot with the Isla Barley's, whether it's Brook Lady or, or, uh, or Port Charlotte yeah. or Octomore as well. But I think that kind of helps to dry it out a little bit more and it seems to have a little bit more of a, you can, ten, you can kind of get the alcohol a bit more in this one than what mm. you do with the PC-10. Yeah. Yeah, it almost feels a bit more powerful, I would say, even yeah. though it's the same ABV, but it is a bit younger. So again, like that age is showing that the younger is going to be a little bit more intense on the palate and the and on the nose too. Um, but yeah, while we're while we're tasting this one, um, we've got some exciting updates, I suppose, from Isla um, that we've not long planted the 2021 growing uh, season. So it's well underway on the island. And it's like the weather now because we've had shocking weather. As soon as that barley was planted, it's just been rain, wind, uh, pretty much no sunshine since the day of planting. Um, so it's like it knows. But we this year we've got 19 farmers um, currently growing for us, which will hopefully again bring in that uh, over half of the, the annual needs. Um, and last year we got just over 1,600 tonnes of barley, which is an incredible statistic to be able to, to share. Um, but to put it into perspective, a lot of the time Isla barley seems like the most logical thing because it's on the island, it's close to the distillery. But on the mainland, we're actually av averaging about three to four tonnes per acre 
um, of barley yield. On Isla, we average about 1.5, if we're lucky, tonnes per acre. So you can see really there, like the farmers have to put up with a lot and um, they have to work really hard to get that tonnage in. But again, it's all about flavour um, that we're that we're going to get here. So um, whether we make this a single vintage, whether we make it a multi-farm vintage um, is completely dependent on the growing season itself and how that kind of comes to light. But really exciting to be into what is the 17th year of growing barley on Isla. And who would have thought we'd be 17 years down the line and still making whiskey that we've, we've never, never tasted before, which is really exciting. It's amazing to think that, you know, it's, it's been 17 years now and, you know, we really had to convince the farmers to do it for us and, you know, to, to trust us. And, you know, if we, yeah. if we weren't, you know, such a well-liked distillery, if that, I don't know if that's right, but, you know, just, we've got such community spirit at the distillery. We are the largest um, single employer on Isla um, and we are all about Isla. We're very Isla centric. Um, you know, a lot of people um, that work for the distillery grew up on Isla. Chloe, you're, you're one of them as well. Um, that, you know, without us being who we are in the community, the farmers would never have said yes to us to, to try and grow barley for making whiskey because uh, as Chloe said, you know, the weather's not great for growing barley on Isla. Uh, we've got to put up with uh, barnacle geese as well, who we've got to wait for them to migrate off the island before planting the seeds. Otherwise, they'll, you know, feast themselves on that. We've got those yeah. amphibious deer that come through and ravage the crops as well. Um, you know, it's, we've, it's, it's so hard for the farmers to be able to get enough tonnage for us to be able to produce these whiskies mm -hmm. that, you know, even every year, it's still a bit of a challenge for them to do that. And then it comes down to that ugly word yield that distilleries tend to use. You know, there's less yield coming from Isla barley compared to Scottish mainland barley. And then, you know, even that's less than barley grown on uh, the rest of Europe as well. So it's, uh, it's definitely a lot of challenges to produce these phenomenal whiskies. Yeah, yeah, agreed. And I, I think as well, like for us, it's, it's about Isla and the community. It's again, it's not just about whiskey. So for example, if one of the other distilleries wanted to grow barley on the island, we're totally for that you know it's we're not we're not just trying to keep these farmers for just us and um, but it just doesn't make sense for some of the, the other distilleries to do so and I think that's what's real special although Brickladdy is a, is a distillery that's growing and growing and growing and um, we're still managing to kind of hone in on keeping these farmers part of our process as well and it's uh, if we can grow more barley on the island the more barley the better you know, it's, uh, it's an ever, ever growing thing, so to speak. Amazing. All right. So what are we thinking taste wise on this one? Uh, so John's, we'll start with John again. Uh, it's obviously the biggest paragraph to get through before everyone else's, uh, but keep him coming, John. We absolutely love him. Um, he says the Isle of Bali is a lot more coconut influence in comparison to the 10 must sticks, mm -hmm. green crisp apples, and then barbecue beef brisket with some hickory sauce, um, making me very hungry. Um, he's not the only one that references barbecue. Uh, Paul says this one's great with barbecue smoky ribs. Um, I'll give you a bit of a tip. You can actually make a barbecue, a Port Charlotte barbecue sauce. So just mix in one part Port Charlotte to two parts barbecue sauce, uh, mix them together and, and makes a really amazing thing to, to coat your ribs with. Um, I'm sure everyone's going to try that tomorrow. Yeah. Um, what else have we got? Um, Luke says, for me, this one starts with the citrus hit up front, smoked barbecue meats and maple syrup finish. Uh, it's their favourite so far. Um, and Anton says, creamy vanilla and honey. Yeah. And also just to pick up on Darren's comment there. So if, if um, when, when you're chatting about Port, Char Port Charlotte and La Barley, of course, we've got the different bottles for for Claddy, Port Charlotte and Optimore. Um, but we will do an Isla Barley variant for each of the, the three brands. So Brickladdy Isla Barley will clearly state it's Isla on the label. Port Charlotte will also do the same. And then the Octomore is the 0.3 edition. But each of them will always say Isla Barley. Um, if you've tasted the 2007, uh, that was a, a Brickladdy Isla Barley unpeated, which was from Rockside Farm, which is, it's been a standout one for, since it was released, and it will always be, I think, people's one one of people's favourites. Um, and also, it's one of the only 
single farm, single vintage releases that we've done of Isla Barley in, in the past. Um, but yeah, it will always say Isla Barley if it's just specifically grown with barley from the island itself. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, and a couple of questions, a couple of comments have come through since I mentioned using single malt whiskey for making a barbecue sauce. Uh, I'm not <laughs> going to apologise at all. Um, you know, we, we don't care how you use our whiskey at all. Um, I did an event one time where they used the botanist to make a sauce for a fish. They used Brooklady in some sausages. Um, Port Charlotte was a glaze. And then the Octomor, I think we finished off and we injected it into a, uh, into a brisket. Absolutely amazing. Best meal I've had in my life. Um, we don't care how you drink our whiskeys if you want to have them neat on ice, if you want to have it in a highball, use them in cocktails, whatever you want to do. Just keep drinking them because you're going to keep Chloe yeah. and me in a job and Craig Thank as well. You so. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that's it. You know, like, again, whiskey can become it can become a very, you have to drink it this way. You've got to drink it without water. You know, you can't drink it with ice. But really, it becomes comes down to personal enjoyment. And uh, yeah, like Andy said, Port Charlotte 10, like in a highball, for example, is so easy to drink. And it's just the way, the way you enjoy it. Like, Again, jumping back to John, like I love the pairings that you guys do, like with the boiler makers. It's all about just flavor and how you kind of develop that in your palate. So yeah, it's completely open. I think the last time I used anything myself, I feel like I've got to compete with you, Andy. What did I do? I did botanist cured salmon, which was beautiful. Um, but yeah, I've not done anything with whiskey in a long time. So maybe, maybe that's this weekend's experiment. Huh? It also helps we do get a few sample bottles delivered, you know. To, to the door and we can we can have a bit of fun with that one as well <laughs> the best fun that i have is is when we do a lot of whiskey dinners and they're really popular these days you know oh. three years ago it was just you know whiskey with with wine matching and um you know that's fantastic to do you know i always have a bottle of wine when i'm uh, drinking dinner well not not when i'm having dinner every time but whenever i go out for dinner you know i'll grab a bottle of wine and finish yeah. with some whiskey and some cheese and some chocolate which match really well i always tend to, to mention whiskey and chocolate um, I do love my whiskey and chocolate, um, but, you know, whiskey matched with food dinners are getting really popular these days and being able to sit down with a chef and have a few drams with him and, and talk about how we can pair the different whiskies. And, you know, the Brook Laddie's fantastic because we've got the four different brands that we can use to, to match and do four amazing courses. And then even then, you know, we can do barley exploration and cask exploration and, and all that kind of stuff. So Amazing. Fabulous. Amazing. Well, will we jump on to the Octomore, Andy? Are you ready? Let's do it. This is where I start watching Paul because Paul is a, a newfound Octomore fanatic since our, our first meeting. So I'm watching you. It's already done. The dram's gone, eh? It's, it's finished. It's finished. <laughs> um, but yeah, we thought it seems quite a, a strange way to do it because we are going from two Port Charlottes to an Octomore and then jumping back to Port Charlotte, but there is there is method to the madness. Um, and yeah, we wanted to kind of introduce this um, Octomore 11.1 to you guys just now. So um, we shall crack in. So for those of you who have tasted Octomore in the past, thank you for re rejoining us and tasting it again. You know, it's, it's a cause, you know, you've got to get involved. For those of you who have not, I'm really excited to hear your feedback on it and see what you guys think. Um, as I mentioned at the start, Octomore is our super heavily peated whiskey. So this means that our malt is anything over 80.5 parts per million. So that's just the limit that we've gone for. It can be anything over, it just cannot go under that 80.5. So really uh, the concept of Octomore, um, it was first distilled way back in, um, what was it, the, day, the Thursday, 3rd of October, 2002, with a PPM of 80.5. Um, and it all came about from sourcing this super heavily peated malt from Baird's Maltings. People told us it wouldn't be possible to distill it. And at the time, Jim McEwen, head distiller, just basically takes it wouldn't be possible to a new challenge. And no one knew if it was going to work. No one knew if it was going to become a successful thing. But after that first distillation, it became very much a prominent part of our whiskey series that we released at the distillery. And you know, Octomore as a, as a concept is really designed to push boundaries. So we're, we're wanting to try to challenge your perception of what whiskey can be and what single malt should be within the whiskey industry. So we do this through a series of limited experimental releases. 
So every series we'll release four editions within that series. Um, and we can take you through the fact that, you know, point one will always be American oak, first fill, Scottish barley. Point two, typically went into duty free, but we've now placed this into the Laddie shop online. So the, the 11.2 is still available on there. That'll be European oak influenced. Point three is Isla barley, which is why you've got that white frosted glass bottle. And then the point four is the cask exploration series. So in other words, that's Brickladdy's way of saying that's how easy it is to understand our crazy series of, uh, of Octomore. Um, but we know this works because it's the impossible equation. So it's all about making sure that we don't focus too much on the numbers, but we focus about the flavour profile. So with the 11 series, I think it's a testament to, to Adam and to the distillery that we're still able to showcase another style of Octomore and these endless I suppose, possibilities of its creation. So without further ado, we'll crack into the 11.1. And just before we had, uh, we opened up the call, we were having a chat and like I had said, the 11.1 the is actually my favorite out of the 11 series. Like I absolutely love it. And usually I'm driven by the Isla Barleys just because of, again, the story that the flavor that they bring. But um, yeah, the 11.1 is is my go-to out of the 11s. I, Andy, I don't know what your, your one is yet, but um, yeah, look, it's it, it's a toss up between the eleven point one and the eleven point three. Um, mm. It's it's weird with the with the ten series. I think it was. I was the the ten point one. I, I loved over the ten point three at the start, but yeah. since going back to them, I've driven more back to the to the point three for the ten series. Um, yeah, but with this one, I actually haven't sat down and tasted them side by side, so it's always been separate tastings. But it's one of those things with the Octomore, you just constantly surprised every time you revisit them and yeah. you know it, it changes and you know you go back to older ones and then come back to the new ones and you know as chloe said it's it's this impossible equation you know you've got if you look at all scotch whiskey drinkers um like globally you know 80 percent of them drink blends 10 percent drink uh blended malts and then 10 percent drink single malts so then if you get yeah. those single malt drinkers you could say 10 percent of those like heavily peated whiskies and then there's another 10% that like cast drink whiskies. And we're trying to kind of get all those together and do a super heavily peated, you know, almost cast drink whiskey. And, and to do something that's so elegant and refined, but, you know, you still know that the peat's there, you know that the alcohol's there, to be able to balance it out. And I think, you know, Brook Lady would be the only distillery that could do it by, you know, with our, our, our slow trickle distillation and our stills and, just the care that we do with with everything that we make there is you know mm -hmm. we call it the the iron fist in the velvet glove because mm -hmm. it's just such a phenomenal whiskey and you know if you look at whiskey as being a religion which it's easy to do for quite a few people uh, i'm yeah. one of those then octomore is a cult in in there and it's uh it's amazing actually when chloe was out here last i think it was or or might have been the release of the nine series octomore um, yeah, maybe. We, we had maybe. three events and we did one with Craig at the work club and uh, and we had the same three, two guys come to all three nights for, <laughs> yeah. for tasting the same whiskey every time. And it's it's definitely got this draw card and people talk about it. And, uh, you know, we've gone from being bigger releases to being smaller yearly releases because, you know, everyone wants to try the new Octomore, the new Octomore, the new Octomore. And, um, yeah, it's it's definitely one of those whiskeys that, you know, it's it's not a daily drinker. Um, if yeah. it is a daily drinker for you, then I'll come ready house and shake your hand and have a dram with you. <laughs> um, but it's definitely a destination whiskey. But you know, again, finishing a meal, having some cheese or a cigar or something like that, it's bang sure. on. Yeah, it's, it's a cracker. And I think with the with this this point one, it's it's the perfect introduction to the the eleven series. You know, you've got that first fill American oak uh, cast in here. So we're using Jim Beam, Heaven Hill and Jack Daniels as the, the maturation profile in this one. Um, but it's a real clean example of Octomore spirit. You know, you've not got that further maturation. It, it's, it's five years old. We're not putting it into wine casts or sherry or anything. It's just nice, clean spirit, amazing influence in those first five years of maturation. And it kind of acts as this control for the series because it creates this benchmark of quality that we expect the series to, to follow on from. Um, so there, this, this whiskey here that you guys are you're trying, five years old, 139.6 parts per million. So on the scale of phenol count, it's on the lower end of an Octomore. 
scale. But again, we're not looking at focusing on that number whatsoever. It's about the taste that we're trying to, to achieve. So when we when we go for that taste, you know, when I was trying it there, that, that presence of peat smoke on the palate is massive on the 11.1, but it's so well balanced with these clean fruit floral notes, which is just things you just wouldn't expect to say when you're talking about the world's heaviest peated single malt, you know. Um, but with it being American oak for the maturation, oh, look at that, showing all the samples in the camera mm -hmm. there. Um, with the aroma, you'd expect after hearing these figures, it'd be overpowering, but it's super subtle, delicate on the nose, real earthy peat smoke once again. Um, in the, the palate, you've got that high strength of the ABV, so 59.4, carrying through, but I get loads of like stone fruit, that peach influence, um, and really malty sweet finish. So yeah, it's it's an absolute cracker. And um, of course, they are still available. It's the series that's currently out. We are currently working on the 12s as we speak, which is very exciting liquid coming um, to you shortly. And as I said to Craig, because I'm working a lot more with the brand team at the moment, this is where I can get myself and the, the distillery into trouble and tell you exactly what the 12s are going to be. So I'm going to restrain myself on this one <laughs> and try not to say it too much, too much, but some very exciting things moving forward. <laughs> Nathan's Nathan's just asked if there's any plans to head back to the PPM of the 8.3. And um, for the people that don't know what the 8.3 is, and uh, it's definitely one of the Octomores that gets wrapped up in the numbers probably the most. And the reason for that yeah. is it's the most heavily petted whiskey ever produced. Uh, and it was petted to a phenolic count of 309.1 ppm, which to, to give you a bit of an idea, you know, the port charts are 40 ppm. Um, this one that we're drinking now is 139.6. And that was 309.1 and that was uh one of the one of, it was the malt that was grown on Octomore farm which is just around the corner from the distillery a couple of miles away um and it's it's one of these things that we can't control how peated the barley gets the malt that we get um in fact every house or every distillery that uses peated malt they always peat higher than what their house ppm is so with port charlotte it's 40 it gets peated higher and then they cut it back with unpeated malt to bring it back to 40 ppm. So for an example, if beds uh, peat to 80 ppm and we want to get to 40, we just use equal amounts of peated and unpeated malt to bring it back down. It's just a, a simple mathematical equation. And that's kind of how the idea around Brooklyn, I'm sorry, around how Optimal came about was when Jim traveled to beds to have a chat to them about how this thing kind of worked out. And you know, that's how the story went. But, you know, Jim worked for Bemore for, uh, many, many years, over 40 years. So I reckon he's probably had a pretty good idea about how the malting process worked by then. But mm -hmm. um, we asked Beds, you know, what's the heaviest you've ever peated? And they said, oh, we wouldn't go over 80. If we did, it would be undrinkable. You wouldn't be able to use it for making whiskey. So they, they essentially just discarded it at the time. And Jim looked at that as being a bit of a challenge and said, well, next time you do something over 80, can we buy it off you and, and we'll do it? And that's, you know, essentially how Brook Laddie started yeah. back in... Uh, uh, so what did you just say, 2000 and... 2002. 2002, yep. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's we, we got our first malt at 80.5 ppm. So there's so many different variables that go into when we're, you know, essentially using smoke to put phenolics into the barley. You know, it can be the, um, the moisture content of the barley, you know, the more yeah. moisture content that's in the barley, the more um, of the phenolics will stick into the DNA of the barley. Um, you know, it's the same... You know, if you've ever been around a campfire or you've got a fire pit at home, if you're wearing a wet T-shirt, it'll end up being more smoky um, than if you wear a dry T-shirt because it sticks to those moisture in there. Um, the, the, how long you peat for as well. You know, Octomore is a seven-day process, 24 hours a day. They work in eight-hour shifts, the maltsters, to, to be able to make sure that the fire is strong enough that it's not going to... It's going to stop the germination of the barley, but not too strong that it's going to dry it out too quickly. So the longer that we can keep that fire at the right level and, and stop germination, but then also allowing more smoke to go through means more phenolics that are going to go into the barley there. So, you know, it, the 8.3 was definitely a bit of a freak from what we've seen recently. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, we, we can't control it. We can't just go, well, let's put more smoke into that one for, for you know, because we can, because we can't, we can't control smoke, unfortunately. Um, but then, you know, you look at the tens and they were lightly peated, but it allowed a bit more of that kind of, that elegance of the optimal malt to shine through from not being so, you know, covered with peat over the top. 
Do you agree, yeah. Yeah, no, I think it's, it's really well explained there. And, and it also kind of comes back to, you know, like you say, that PPM figure that we get is just what it is from the maltings. But for example, we've we've had Octomores come out at, you know, this 130 that maybe tastes smokier than something that comes out at 208. So the number is just there because we want to be as transparent as we can with everyone that's drinking it. But, you know, having a higher phenolic reading doesn't always mean that it's going to taste much, much more more smoky. You know, sometimes for us, we'll do tastings of Octomore and then go back to Port Charlotte, like we're about to do. And sometimes people can pick more smoke out of, you know, the Port Charlottes on the nose and the palate than they sometimes can for Octomore. So it's really about dispelling the numbers with Octomore. Um, and it's partly our fault because for many years we did focus on the PPM content, you know, because it was such an exciting kind of prospect for us to be getting higher and higher figures. But actually we realized very quickly that there's so much more to an Octomore release than just the PPM on the on the bottle. Although that being said, we always want to challenge to see what see what's possible. You know, it's all about creativity, seeing what's going on. And yeah, 309 was as much a shock for you guys when we released it as it was for us to receive it at the distillery. Um, but there is definitely numbers up there um, in and around that area that we still to still to produce. I think that's the great thing about Octomore is, you know, we continue to, to challenge perceptions about single malt whiskey, car strength, peating levels. Um, but then also, you know, looking at um, casts that we use within it and then also ages as well. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure if anyone on here got to taste the the 10.4, which is actually in my top three of whiskies. And it was a three-year-old that we released and it was matured 100% in uh, first fill virgin oak casks. And it was an absolutely phenomenal dram. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Really cool stuff. Amazing. All right. Well, will we jump on to the final drama of the evening? I think, Andy, we've actually managed to keep time relatively well for us on this one. <laughs> I know, it's bizarre. I was just looking at the time before, but, you know, we're going to be open for questions, so it's probably going to be another hour after this as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah, I think keep them coming in. We we're excited to see any taste notes come out, and we'll maybe pull a few. Um, but what we're going to taste last or to finish up the tasting with is something very, very special. And when Craig said he had this bottle um, in his collection that he's going to put into the tasting, it's always lovely because it is the Port Charlotte Valinch that we're going to have now. And the Valinch, for anybody that doesn't know, is a, is a hand fill from the laddie shop on the islands. So these are single casks. Uh, once they're done, they won't happen again. They're 500 mils and usually you have to be on the island to get a bottle as well. So it's really exciting um, that we've got something like this that's just really limited uh, to get your hands on. Um, and, you know, the Valinch itself obviously comes from the Laddie shop. So a little bit of a, an Isla update for you guys. We are looking at hopefully hopefully opening the Laddie shop up in June, um, albeit very much with rules and regulations in place. But you can see things slowly returning to normal on the island, which is great because the island feeds off of people visiting as much as anything, you know, and it's, a, it's been a very, very quiet place over this last year. Um, so it'll be great to see people in and about the laddie shop. But a highlight for folk kind of coming and visiting the distillery. And Andy, I think you've been at the Valinch casks uh, getting a little sample as well, as, I, as do I. Um, but in the corner, there's always these two casks. And um, you can go over, you have to hand fill the bottle, you hand label it, you know, you then it's your bottle, potentially maybe 280 bottles minimum up to about that 500 mark if it's like a sherry cask, but they're 500 mils right from the distillery. So right now we've always got a Brickladdy and we've got a Port Charlotte. So the Brickladdy kind of follows suit of the staff and it's paying a uh, tribute to the wonderful team we've got at the distillery. Um, I think we might be on number 50 odd now, um, but we've still obviously got another 60 to go to, to kind of cover off all the staff for the Brickladdy side. And the Port Charlotte is all about places that are significant to the distillery and to, to Port Charlotte as well. Um, but traditionally and historically, we've released so many amazing Valinches and, you know, they were all kind of paying a tribute to significant times in 
just because they were fun times as well. So it was maybe something about the Lions Tour, the rugby. We did Wimbledon. We did Harrison Ford, Temple of Drams, uh, French Connection, just to name a few. But we're talking hundreds of mm -hmm. lynches in the past. Uh, Andy, have you ever tasted any yourself of those old school lynches? Uh, I'm just trying to think. I, I know I have over the years. Um, but yeah. you know, it's, it's one of those things that the distillery, you know, in those early years, you know, the early 2000s were just doing so many releases. It's, it's unless you keep an, a logbook of them, it's hard to oh, keep track of, of all the releases. And you know, they've all just been amazing. And, you know, it's, it's hard to pick a standout from any of them. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think what this shows is, you know, at the distillery, the, the single cast, these are Adam's choosing. So, you know, putting them into the shop, it's just to show what else that brand has got going on. So what else we can do in Brooklady? What else we can do in Port Charlotte? Um, so, yeah, enjoy this one. Cheers, guys. Um, this is the Port Charlotte Distillery Valinch. So cheers, the last one. Um, definitely not the last one of your night, I hope, but you can uh, you can continue as planned. Uh, this is the Distillery Valinch BC04, which was actually the February Valinch in the shop. And this is cask 1955. So every year we start from cask zero and work our way up. So it's about middle of the year it's been filled. And it was distilled in um, March 2006, which makes it a 13 year old whiskey. So actually 13 years old for a Port Charlotte is old, you know, You've just tasted the 10, but we very, very rarely go above that. Um, but it's been fully mature for 13 years in first fill bourbon casks. So that's why BC is bourbon cask. Really difficult one for us to figure out that on that one there. And we can tell you all the details of that. Uh, so 2006 single cask, 301 bottles globally, completely finished and 60.9%. Uh, so this is cask strength whiskey here. So this is why we managed to put it last because it will compete with the Octomore's ABV of uh, that 59.4 as well. Um, but what we, we thought we'd do, now I don't have a sample of that cask here because it's a Valinch and Andy hasn't tasted it before. So we thought we'd throw this back at you guys and really see what your tasting notes are. And we will actually be led by you guys on this final tasting because you're tasting it for the first time, Craig and Anton as well, you're tasting it as well. So it'd be great to hear what you guys think. Um, but any taste notes that come to mind, any nose and notes, anything. I think we've got, oh, I've got a few coming in now. That's amazing. Fizzy citrus smoke, walnut and fig, super fruity. Oh. I love it. I love it. Hot puree, dried think, apricots. Yeah, it sounds amazing. It sounds yeah, beautiful. Kevin coming in. And, uh, and just to give you an idea about this, you know, as, as Chloe said, she doesn't have a bottle. I ne never had a bottle come over to me because they are you know, distillery exclusives and, and normally it's reserved for when you get to go over and visit. And, and on, you know, when flights are available for when we can travel again, uh, definitely put Isla at the top of your list to go over there. When you do go over, get in touch with me. Let me know, myself or Chloe, and we'll definitely, you know, roll out the the, the red carpet oh. for when you come. And you know, we we treat everyone like family when you go over there. It's you know, everyone says that it's definitely the highlight of their Isla trip going to Brooklady, and you get to go and bottle your own uh, Valinch uh, at the distillery. You know, you hand bottle it yourself. You put your own label on. Um, we don't let you use the the heat gun to do the seal because you know OHNS issues. But it's it's definitely an experience to do that. And since the borders have been closed and and flights have been shut down, we've done it as an online ballot. So you know, no special treatment for Craig here to jump on and, and jump on the ballot himself. And uh, for anyone in Australia that's not really sure what a ballot's like, it's probably like a a, a really badly run chook raffle. Um, <laughs> It's, 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 it's been a, a, a thing. And for anyone that's on the Brooklady, um, uh, Brooklady Facebook page for the Brooklady fans or um, Friends of Brooklady page. Friends of Brooklady, yeah. All the time celebrating when they've won a ballot and, and then, uh, you know, looking for, uh, uh, for some sympathy when they haven't won. But uh, it's, it's definitely something that, you know, we've had to evolve over time as well with the way that we've, we've run these things. Um, but, you know, it's, it's really cool that we've still been able to be able to release all these, all these awesome yeah. Valinches over these over these years. It's am, year. It is amazing, and like you know, when you see people come in, um, <laughs> like at one point 
we were releasing like bourbon casks and wine casks. So, you know, you're going from like that 195 liter right up to like 230 liters. And at the start of this process, we were thinking, you know, these will be in the shop for a little while. It'll give us time to think about the next the lunch cask. And then summer came on Isla. And I think at one point we had the cask come in one morning. It was like, a, it was when I was working in the shop um, from this story anyway, it came in on like a Tuesday morning, nine o'clock. We got in, opened the doors to the laddie shop. And by two o'clock in the afternoon, we were like, we need to get the next cask in, you know, and that's a cask of whiskey just gone. Just because, you know, it's special, you know, folk can taste it there at the distillery. They can taste a single cask. And when they bring it back to like, if they're going back to, as you know, Germany, Australia, the US, it's something that potentially nobody in the rest of that country will, will have a bottle of. So it's it's such a cool and a really special way to release whiskey. Um, and we'll continue doing it for sure. Okay, so it's let's also get into some of these tasting notes here. So we've got yeah. dried apricots, cheesecakey, um, oh. weed, first nose with savory, sun-dried tomatoes as a question, then fruit and apricot. Uh, nice. Smoky lemon meringue pie, lemon zest, um, almonds, lemon sherbet, vanilla bean, Turkish delight chocolate, apricots, campfire smoke, slight mineral note, uh, grapefruit and orange, it's smoky lemon meringue pie. Someone's asking oh. for another sample. Fair point. Yeah, me too. Eh? <laughs> That's it. And then uh, and vanilla as well. So, yeah, fantastic tasting notes. Amazing. Girls. Yeah, really, really exciting stuff. And yeah, thank you. Thank you, Craig, for, for dropping that one into the, the tasting on that for everybody, I'm sure. By the sounds of things, it's been very, very well received, which is which is always great to great to hear. Um, and yeah, I think just before uh, we open it up to, to you guys and you can jump on, ask us any questions, we'll just do like a nice open, easy Q&A kind of side of it. I just wanted to mention that, of course, we have festival coming up if we're chatting all things Isla the fish eel is very very fast approaching all of us have got a bit of a stressed feeling going on at the distillery because of course um, this year we're not doing anything physically but it'll be another virtual festival uh, which means that you know for the fact that no one can travel everybody can still get involved which is really great to to see um, so I just wanted to say that that the date of that is the 30th of May um, we're going to be using a platform hopefully called Hopin, which means that all the content filmed, recorded and presented during festival, it probably won't link up with you guys time wise, um, because of course you're nine hours ahead of us. But if you do sign up and register on the website, um, you know, for all things laddie time travellers, you'll still be included for all the content, any ballots that go on on the day and everything that we're trying to bring to life, you should be able to watch at your own kind of leisure. So feel free, I know you might not be able to join live, but if you want to see it at a later date, sign up on the website. I think it's the first page that you might reach uh, when you go into brooklady.com. Uh, are there any tasting packs? The tasting packs went out on ballot. Um, and they've already been shipped. So that was that was very, very fast. They, they kind of came in and left. But there may be some exciting stuff coming up on the day that you still would be worthwhile signing up and registering uh, with us. Uh, but yes, it's exciting. Uh, we've got like 20, what's that, 28 days to go, which, uh, sorry, 18 days to go, which is very, very scary. But um, yeah, we're very excited to, to kick that one off on the island. So yeah, but yeah, I think just to finish up before we open up, everyone's cameras and uh, and microphones can come on. For myself and I know from Andy, thank you so much for for the continued support of uh, of you guys for for the distillery for Brickladdy. Um, it's really great to see you guys all on screen, and we cannot wait to welcome you back to either physical tastings or back to the distillery whenever that's next possible it's uh, it's definitely a trip we'll be celebrating whenever they happen so thank you everybody for your time uh, tonight as well for me cheers <laughs> cheers thanks to craig for uh, organizing everything for working so hard shipping everything um but mainly for being an, an amazing brooklady authorized reseller um for so you know, allowing us to be able to, to share some awesome whiskey with you Thanks, Andy and Chloe. You've done a wonderful job tonight. Just kept us engaged the whole time, which was fantastic. It just and you you nearly kept the time, so that's not too nearly bad. not too bad. They're good whiskies. Lots of tasting notes to be to be spoken about. So well done. 
That was good. Um, it was, uh, I just want to thank everybody as well for jumping on. Uh, you're welcome to hang around for this little question time and a little bit of conversation that we have between each other. Um, we might say stuff as well that we're not supposed to say, like something about the Optimore 12 series, if you hang around. Oh, Craig, then, man, don't the, mention it again. <laughs> yeah, Craig, you just need to stop recording before we can release all that information. Somebody might leak. <laughs> yeah, so I'll, I will stop the recording. Um, thanks to everybody. Let everybody know that we do have a Cavalan tasting coming up. Uh, on the 25th of um, 25th of May, you get to taste the Artist series from Cavalan. So that was a limited series from Cavalan, only place in the world that is actually doing a tasting on it. There were 1,000 milliliter bottles for released, and I think in the tasting you get about seven whiskies. Well, I think six whiskies and a gin. So jump online and book yourself in for that. The tickets are going very quickly. We'll put a link on there for that tasting as well, in case you're interested. Um, and uh, yeah, that's uh, that's also. I'm gonna, what I'm going to do now is stop the recording, and then we're going to hook uh, Chloe into telling us about. 12. Okay, guys, lovely to see everybody. See you later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll stay on.